Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar on where to go when your bioinformatics outgrows your compute. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for today. In our webinars, we aim to share useful information about the latest dig digital techniques, data and tools available to the life sciences community. Each month we hear about a bioinformatics topic that we hope will support Australians to deliver their best environmental, agricultural and medical research. You can keep up to date with the latest Australian Biocommons news and events via the channels listed on your screen. Before we begin today, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. In my case in Brisbane, this is the Turrbal and Yuggera people. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So access to compute infrastructure is fundamental for bioinformaticians and life science researchers, but it can be challenging to know where to get started. This webinar has been jointly organised with the Sydney Informatics Hub and is intended to give you an idea of the resources that are available in Australia and the applications that they are suited for. We'll hear about several computing resources available to Australian researchers. These include Galaxy Australia, the Nectar Research Cloud, NCI, PAWSI, and um, we'll also introduce the National Merit Allocation Scheme for access to HPC. Finally, we'll wrap up the webinar with a short Q&A. We have several speakers joining us today to share their expertise, and I'd like to welcome all of them and thank them for being here as well. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Gina Samaha and Dr. Tracy Chu from the CB Informatics Hub, who will describe basic compute needs and how to choose the right infrastructure for your needs. I'm now going to hand over to Georgina to get us started. So you can all see my, my screen, okay? Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, so hi everyone, thank you for coming today. Um, as Melissa mentioned, I'm a bioinformatician at the Sydney Informatics Hub. Um, in our work with the Australian Biocommons, we've been designing pipelines um, specifically for researchers who work with the national compute infrastructure. Uh, we focus mostly on pipelines that um, are the starting point for those of us who work with next generation sequence data. So that's included things like genome alignment and variant calling, um, RNA-seq and sequence assembly. Um, and as a condition of designing these pipelines for the infrastructure, we've had to make sure that um, we know how to make efficient use of the compute hardware that we're working with. Um, so I've recently completed a PhD in genomics, um, and I've been recently reflecting on how uh, different the work I'm doing now with Biocommons is compared with the high performance computing I did during my PhD. Um, I've sort of attempted to capture uh, my experiences here in the slide. Um, I was lucky enough to have access to my university's HPC. Um, in getting access, I didn't have to um, prove that I knew how the infrastructure worked or that my pipelines were particularly efficient. Um, I was able to just get them working at a basic level and that was fine. Um, but in taking that approach, I think that I struggled with some things that really impacted my ability to be more ambitious in the kind of projects that I took on and the work that I did. Um, so the things that I struggled with included things like using the job scheduler, um, designing pipelines that were fast and could scale up efficiently as I added more samples, uh, estimating resources like memory um, and how long my jobs would take to run, um, and understanding the particular resource needs of the different tools that I used and how that related to how quickly that they were able to run. And there are plenty of reasons that we all struggle with these things. Um, our data sets are often very big and complex. And unlike a lot of other disciplines that use um, high performance computing, most of our tools aren't actually designed to run on HPCs. Um, so we often have to piece together pipelines consisting of multiple tools that have um, very different resource needs. So um, before we hear from some of the representatives of the different compute facilities today, um, I'm just gonna run through why we have these problems and how understanding that can make high performance computing more approachable and accessible, um, no matter what infrastructure you're working with. Uh, and how we can use this information to choose the um, infrastructure that best meets our needs. 
Um, so ultimately, most of the reasons we struggle with bioinformatics comes down to the fact um, that our data sets um, and the algorithms that we apply to them are very complex. The algorithms that bioinformatics tools like sequence aligners and assembly, assemblers use um, are designed what are, uh, to solve what are called NP hard problems. So these problems um, show a factorial increase in runtime as we add more input. So the larger and more complicated our data and our analyses, the longer it's going to take to process, but that increase in time is completely disproportionate to the input that we give it. And this complexity is inherent in biological data. So we need to use high performance computing to reduce these um, extremely complex processes to tasks that are computationally manageable and can give us results in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but unfortunately for us, because of all the differences in the data sets that we work with, these tools are never going to be able to offer us a one size fits all optimal level of performance. Um, and as life scientists, we, you know, we work with a lot of um, very different organisms that have different size genomes, um, proportions of repetitive elements and variants and a range of ploidy levels um, that add complexity to varying degrees. So performing something like um, a sequence alignment, for example, um, you know, for a species of bacteria is going to be vastly different um, to say uh, a wheat species, which is um, a much larger and more complex genome. So your compute needs are gonna change uh, with each data set you use um, and the different tools that you're using. Um, and you need to take the time to understand this when you're designing your pipelines. So I often think it's useful to uh, think of these computing problems that we face as a, a two-way street. Um, we expect the infrastructure that we're using to reliably process our data in a timely manner, um, but it can only do that if we use the systems as they're intended to be used. Uh, it's important to appreciate that not all compute infrastructures are created equal, um, and it's not just a matter of scale either. These infrastructures have very different hardware architectures, um, so things like the way disk space and memory are distributed can influence what kind of jobs they're best suited to doing. So if you're someone who works with large sample, sample sets, say, um, you know, hundreds at a time and organisms with big genomes um, and pipelines with very high memory loads, your work is probably going to be better suited to some of the national HPC uh, facilities that are offered by PAUSI and NCI. And alternatively, if you work with, uh, say, smaller data sets or smaller organisms um, and pipelines with less intense memory needs, uh, then maybe Galaxy or Cloud are going to be better options for you. Um, and of course, there are also a variety of commercial options that can um, scale up or down depending on your particular needs. Uh, so no matter what infrastructure and data you're working with, um, we suggest that you take the time to understand the performance needs of your tools, um, your data sets and the infrastructure you're using and how these things might interact with each other. Uh, take the time to get your head around some best practice bioinformatics concepts like reproducibility, um, scalability, and parallelism. So you can speed your workflows up um, as you need, run them as many times as you need, um, and adjust them to meet changes in your data sets. Uh, we also think uh, you should take the time to understand how your tools work and how they interact with the compute environment and your data. Um, and I've found um, that bioinformatics and high performance computing has become a lot more approachable since I've started considering these things in the context of one another. Uh, so I'm gonna hand over to the representatives of the different compute facilities um, that are available to you now. Uh, and when you're listening to everyone talk today, um, I think it would be very useful if you asked yourself if their infrastructure is suited to the data that you work with and the kind of analyses that you run. Uh, I think Paul's gonna get us started. Thanks, Georgie. Yeah, so my name is Paul Coddington. I'm in the Australian uh, Research Data Commons. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the ARDC provides uh, many services and has many activities, as you can see here, under four basic themes. Um, so the ones that are relevant, I suppose, for this presentation are the research-oriented platforms. Uh, and we support a number of those, including Galaxy, which Simon will talk about in a little while. Uh, under data and services, we provide Research Data Australia that allows you to search for relevant data sets and National Data Assets uh, Program, which, uh, which provides a number of, uh, or, or supports the development of a number of large uh, data collections in, and is a project uh, on human genomics in there that ARDC supports. But there's also the Data Retention Program, which supports uh, large scale data storage. Uh, but the one I'm going to talk about today is the, the National Research Cloud, the Nectar Research Cloud. So uh, next slide. 
So the, the Nectar Research Cloud has been around for almost 10 years now. It's a federation of several organizations that provide the compute and storage infrastructure and uh, essentially the ARDC glues it all together so it looks like a seamless national uh, service. It's quite a large scale compute resource as you can see there. At any given time, we have around 8,000 uh, virtual machines or virtual servers running in the cloud, um, being run by more than 2,000 uh, researchers. Um, and, and a large amount of storage as well are distributed across the organizations there. Um, next slide. So what does this cloud actually provide? So it, it essentially provides virtual servers on demand. So a, a number of people will be perhaps familiar with, you know, having your own dedicated compute server um, for you, yourself or your research group. So essentially cloud uh, pro allows you to uh, fire up those kind of servers uh, for your own use, uh, but we host it for you. Um, so it can be used as either a computational resource uh, or for hosting online services or databases or whatever you want. Um, so cloud compute kind of fills the gap between uh, a desktop PC, which is a dedicated resource to you, but it's fairly sort of modest in its com computational resource or a large scale HPC, which is a shared resource and you need to submit jobs to a queue and they may sit in the queue for a while. So a cloud sort of virtual machine server is something in between. It's a reasonable amount of compute resource. You can scale it up a bit. You can have multiple servers uh, and it's dedicated to you or your research group. So those servers come in many different sizes or what we call flavors. Everything from, you know, you can fire up a virtual machine. This is a single processor on it uh, all the way up to 32 virtual processors and 128 gigabytes of RAM, which is a pretty chunky compute server. Um, recently, we've, we're supporting what we call huge RAM flavors, uh, up to 360 gigabytes of RAM and 48 uh, co uh, virtual cores. But those things are very limited uh, availability and you have very good uh, reasons for using something that large. Uh, but you can, you can do it and you can also have non-standard flavors if you need more than that, that's, that's possible uh, with some negotiation. Uh, the cloud also obviously provides file and based and object based storage. There's a database service as well. And we're developing some new services, including access to GPU servers. Uh, at the moment in the cloud, you can run Jupyter Notebooks or you can set up a, uh, the cloud so it looks like a virtual desktop interface into cloud resources. But that involves a bit of configuration and fiddling around. So we're working on a service where that's easy to access through a simple web interface. Um, Next slide. So there is, uh, as you might expect, a lot of usage of the cloud already for um, there's about 20% of the compute resources are already used for biological sciences or medical and health sciences. There's hundreds of projects using those, uh, um, those uh, the Nectar Cloud resources. And there are a few fairly large projects that uh, are using or have used it, uh, as you see there, Galaxy Australia, which again, you'll hear a bit more about in a minute. Uh, a number of CRCs, and uh, there's a lot of use for, for genomics. There was a, the last ARDC newsletter that just came out, highlighted a, a project to look at threatened species in the Murray River. Um, next slide. So how do you access this uh, wonderful resource? So in fact, any researcher at an Australian university can just log in and start using the cloud. Um, we the accounts are through the Australian Access Federation, which uh, again all Australian universities are members of. So you essentially can log into the uh, the interface, basically using your uh, username, your university username and password. You automatically get an account uh, doing that, and you automatically get a project trial where you can try out a small amount of resource for a, a short period of time. If you uh, want to continue using the cloud with a larger amount of resource, you apply for a project allocation for up to a year, uh, just by submitting a, an online form essentially, um, and that gets assessed by an allocation committee. Now you can apply at any time. It's not something like a research grant or NC mass where there's a particular time you, you're allowed to apply. You can apply at any time. You can change your request a, a new allocation or an extended allocation or more resources at any time as well. Um, there's no direct cost for researchers, ARDC and the nodes uh, and their institutions uh, cover, the, cover the cost of using the cloud. Uh, next slide. 
So uh, it's important to note that we have two types of uh, infrastructure in the research cloud. There's national infrastructure, which is funded by ARDC and it's accessible through a, this, a national allocation scheme. And there's local infrastructure, which is funded by the node members. Uh, so they allocate that resource to their own, uh, their own researchers. So you're eligible for a national allocation if you meet particular criteria, and that's mainly if you have a national competitive research grant or you're part of an increased capability uh, uh, or including ARDC funded projects as ARDC is an increased capability. Uh, there are some other uh, criteria that you may be able to meet as well. It's up to the allocation committee to, to look at those ones that are a bit grayer, but that, that's a smaller amount of uh, resource that's allocated. So yeah, national allocations, if you have a research grant, essentially local allocations, you'll need to negotiate with a, a particular node. Uh, next slide. So we have a lot of user support and training uh, for the cloud, as you might expect. It's always a good idea to do some online tutorials and understand how the cloud works before you start using it. As I said, you can log in and use it anytime, but please take a look at some of the uh, help material and online tutorials so you can understand it a bit more before you start. Uh, there's a help desk that you can email or have uh, a web chat. And we are doing monthly online, um, essentially getting started with Nectar tutorials for new users as well. Uh, next slide. So that's pretty much it. Uh, for more information, you can just go to the ARDC website for more information about ARDC uh, or the Nectar Cloud, or you can uh, email our help desk for if, if you need to ask specific questions or more information. Uh, and that's it for me. All right, hi everybody. Uh, my name's Simon Gladman. I'm a bioinformatician at Melbourne Bioinformatics, part of the University of Melbourne, but I'm also the lead engineer and one of the systems administrators for Galaxy Australia. Next slide, please, George. Okay, so what is Galaxy Australia? Well, it's a, uh, it's a web interface basically that allows you to do data analysis on um, any kind of data really. Um, it can perform uh, visualizations, um, use, you can use tools, it's, and the important part is that it's really easy to use. It has a, a GUI interface, meaning that you don't need to know the ins and outs of the Linux command line to get the most out of it. But the really cool part is that um, it's backed by um, a lot of national computing resources, including those with um, high memory and large core counts that uh, Paul was just talking about. And the aim of Galaxy Australia is to lower the barrier for entry to, into large compute systems and to make them super accessible to everybody. Next slide, please. Okay, so Galaxy Australia is basically a hosted web accessible platform and um, it lets you conduct your research in a reproducible manner. Galaxy remembers everything you do and you can share it with people um, and basically gives you access to a lot of resources without you having to think about it. Um, the Galaxy project is actually a global open source project. It's been around for about 15 years now um, and has a lot of community contributions. I think at last count, there are about 400 developers working on Galaxy. Um, it's used all over the world. Um, it's been cited in over 10,000 publications where people have been using Galaxy to, to do their research. And there's around about eight, thousand almost nine thousand now um, analytical tools available for galaxy and this list is growing all the time and there's a lot of training um, available as well and if you've come to any of the uh, training courses um, that have been put on by els biocommons or um, any of the other local institutions around um, some of them will have been using galaxy and it's a really good platform for teaching and uh, luckily for us galaxy australia has um, currently has ongoing funding, which is really good. Next slide, please. Okay, so currently Galaxy Australia has about 1,400 to nearly 1,500 of, of the uh, 9,000 available tools installed. And uh, the tools that we have installed cover topics like genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, stats, data visualizations, etc. Um, there's currently hundreds of reference data sets available as part of Galaxy as well. And um, importantly, all the tool indices for all of these reference sets are all pre-computed and available, which means that when you run your when you run an analysis, you don't have to sit around and wait for the uh, for the tool to index the genome that you're working on because that's already been calculated. You can just get straight into your analysis. 
Um, and the other thing that Galaxy offers is um, access to hundreds of global peer reviewed workflows. Um, and you can get to these simply um, with one click. You just say, oh, this is the workflow I want to run. And you say, run this workflow, please. Um, and then if we don't have any of the, uh, the tools or the uh, reference data or um, workflows that you, that you want, that you need for your analysis, all you need to do is ask us. There's a button on our homepage that you say request tool or data set or reference data. And um, it'll ping us on um, an email and then we'll install it for you. Next slide, please. Okay. so. As I mentioned before, Galaxy Australia is part of a global community of Galaxy users and trainers and coders and developers. Um, but what this really means is that you as a Galaxy user get to draw on all the experience that all of these people have already um, acquired when they've been using Galaxy. One of the things that Galaxy does, because it remembers everything that everybody does, it can use agglomerated anonymous data to say that, uh, well, Last time somebody ran this tool, it was immediately followed with this second tool. And so it can make um, recommendations to you based upon the types of uh, workflow that you might try be trying to currently build, which is a really cool thing. And it, and it can give you some uh, pointers on where to go next for your analysis. Um, there's a lot of training material available, as I mentioned before, and this is all contained at the Galaxy Training Network, which is actually a community itself. Um, there's uh, a lot of uh, chat uh, rooms available and uh, there's uh, online help resources everywhere. Um, things like Gita and uh, the Galaxy Project help page. And there's also a, a monthly newsletter that comes out as part of Galaxy. Next slide, please. Okay, so one of the things that we've noticed recently for Galaxy Australia is that we've been cited a lot. Um, recently in uh, publications. And here are four of the more recent ones. Um, three of these are from Australia and one of them's from Egypt. But these are all publications that cited Galaxy Australia where all the analysis that they did was performed using our service. And you can see it covers things from bacteria all the way up to uh, um, larger, larger and non-model organisms, which is um, really cool to see. Next slide, please. So how do you access Galaxy Australia? Well, that's pretty simple. You just go to the website, it's usegalaxy.org.au, which is pretty easy to remember. And then you click on the link that says log in or register. Um, if you're from an Australian research institution, we would really like you to use your institutional credentials to register because um, one that um, allows us to put you into a special group that allows you to have more resources than a, than a standard um, registered user. You get a lot more storage space and um, you get access to um, uh, some faster compute resources. Um, we have a fully staffed help desk. So if you uh, send an email to help at genome.edu.au or use any of the help functionality that's built into Galaxy, it will become part of our, our ticketing system, which luckily for us is provided to us by Nectar. And of course, we have um, um, a Twitter account that um, is regularly used to communicate out things that are happening. And all of Galaxy Australia is backed by um, a lot of compute resources and a lot of different people, including the, uh, the Nectar Cloud, um, NCI, Pawsey, um, soon to be Arnet as well. And all of it's been paid for by the people you can see here. All right, thank you. Hi, um, just a quick introduction. Um, Roger Edberg from um, NCI. I manage the user services group uh, there. Um, and with me today, I've got Javed Sheikh, who's uh, here in a supporting role on, on, on a brief overview of NCI and its capabilities. Um, next slide, please. So um, in short, NCI is a, um, a joint effort funded uh, primarily through the um, Australian government NCRIS program, but also including contributions from universities, um, government science agencies and, and um, science institutes across the country. Um, um, our, uh, our, our, 
our public website uh, is is listed uh, on this slide, and and that's probably a good source of information for um, just a general general overview. Um, today, I'd like to just cover some specifics that will be um, useful, probably most useful to bioinformatics users who are interested in 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 using our services. Next slide, please. So, um, in terms of offerings, um, our primary uh, our, our primary offerings are uh, GADI, our current tier one compute system. Um, GADI itself is one part of a combined system that includes Lustre file systems and a mass data tape archive. Um, and, and this constitutes our, our primary HPC capability. Um, Ancillary capabilities are, are available uh, as well. There, uh, there are a set of national uh, data collections that are that are held on on um, on our file systems and managed by uh, a group at NCI. There are also cloud um, and uh, the open on demand service um, are are um, two um, two capabilities that have been available previously but are are undergoing um, up, updates and revision to um, to kind of a next level of service. Um, and uh, a thing to watch is that these will these will be uh, more formally sort of announced and available in um, before the end of the year. Um, in terms of, uh, I should also say with with um, NCI supports a community of of uh, on the order of seven thousand users active user IDs at any given time. That number sort of grows slowly over time as 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 um, we our, our stakeholder base changes. Um, the, the number of uh, research projects is on the order of, of a couple thousand, and again that number grows slowly over time. Those that that community of, of users crosses uh, uh, is spread pretty widely across the spectrum of field scientific fields of research. So um, for um, NCI, we do recognize that bioinformatics is is uh, relatively young and, and very rapidly developing, and um, as uh, as a result, we we're, we we've had to make adjustments, and we're trying to um, we're trying to uh, stay uh, at least stay up with with the the state of the field and and um, adjust our offerings um, to address that this important um, part of the the user community. Um, Gaudi itself uh, can be thought of as a as a uh, a, a very a tier one, a very large sort of national scale supercomputer system. It does have some special some specialized um, hardware um, that can be of particular use to bioinformatics. In particular, the huge mem, mega mem, and and uh, GPU nodes that that are available. Um, huge mem and mega mem give give users um, access to uh, much larger amounts of memory than are available um, uh, on 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 the bulk of of Gaudi's compute nodes. Um, so uh, that's that's something that 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 um, users are learning to leverage, and we're 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 actually getting up to speed with with supporting um, those effectively, uh, but they're. But they're uh, they can be very useful for certain types of, of calculations. Along with that, the GData and Scratch file systems are um, are uh, you know multi petabyte um, file systems, um, all experiencing high demand and 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 being um, incrementally grown over time to support that. Um, next slide, please. So. Um, it's in terms of of using NCI. Um, uh, NCI is a, a collective uh, enterprise with uh, an, a number of, of stakeholders. Uh, so at present, we our stakeholders cross um, government, um, the university sector, uh, and and uh, various consortia and, and institutes. Um, in the government space, <clears throat> the um, the uh, largest um, uh, the largest stakeholders are the Bureau of Meteorology and CSIRO, uh, but but far and away um, the largest um, the largest users in 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 that um, area. Um, 
but also we we um, we've seen progressive growth in, in supporting state um, state government uh, and various various um, activities under under state governments as well, um, and uh, that's uh, that's that's another area we see we see incremental growth over time. The university sector we we um, we have a relatively large um, uh, get a collection of um, universities, um, primarily concentrate on the eastern the eastern uh, states of Australia. Um, and uh, if the thing to note um, for users is that you've if you have uh, if you if if you work at one of the the listed universities, um, you will have a um, a direct entitlement for resources now. And in terms of actually. Um, um, realizing that you may have to you may have to speak to um, um, uh, a local representative because the stakeholders control their resources. And I, in looking at this list, I have to give my apologies to Sydney because they they um, they um, uh, uh, do have an entitlement um, that's managed through the Intersect Consortium. Um, other other uh, stakeholders, uh, BioCommons is a recent. Uh, um, uh, player, um, there uh, is an agreement um, in the works, or very close to being finalized, um, and, and for this, so bio BioCommons community will have access uh, to those resources. We also uh, intersect and QCIF are two long, long-running consortia that that um, have had a presence uh, at NCI. Um, in terms of um, medical research, uh, is a is a growing uh, sector as well. Um, uh, a notable, notable stakeholders there, the Garvin Institute, the Victor Chang uh, Cardiac Research Institute, um, the Autism CRC and Children's Cancer Institute. Um, there, are, um, there are a number of smaller sort of group level um, engagements in, in the medical space as well. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of services, um, help desk is always a good point of contact. Our user registration portal will allow um, users to sign on. And um, also for this community, it's useful to know about perhaps startup projects to allow you to kick the tires on Gadi and, and try some things, uh, test viability of your, of your project, gauge fit, and so on. Um, the user services group and HPC groups in, in particular provide, uh, are able to provide consultation uh, and advice on on workflows, building your applications, and so on. Um, data collections access are managed through a separate mechanism, but that's that's generally open um, open uh, to um, academic users, um, and and uh, information is available through that that main um, main NCI website. Um, cloud and open on demand are are um, new capabilities are coming. Um, previously, NCI Cloud was operated on a um, on a stakeholder uh, entitlement basis and projects using that those services needed to demonstrate a dependence on data that were that were held on NCI systems um, and it was thought of as an ancillary um, capability that's that will no longer be the case with the new new cloud and open on demand services um, it'll be a more generally available um, uh, capability with a more um, also with a more timely um, resource allocation model. So um, uh, shorter terms of of allocation and um, and uh, more more um, agile uh, more ability to adjust as you go. Um, NCI also has a new training group led by Dr. Jingbo Wang. Um, so Jingbo is uh, in the presence of staffing that up and 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 getting uh, getting uh, a, a a new um, training program um, um, out there and available to users. The next slide, please. So um, again, uh, good points of, of uh, reference are the NCI public website, um, nci.org.au, the my.nci website. Uh, there is is uh, for user and, and project registration for this for this community um, a good uh, option is an NCI startup project. If you'd like to try things out, you can apply through that 
through that mine CI system. Uh, and uh, approvals on those are generally pretty quick and easy. Um, you should note, though, um, if you're a, PhD, a research student, you should have your supervisor um, lead that project. Um, and um, but generally, no, no issues getting started. And NCMAS, um, NCI.org.au is the, um, the key place for information on the on National Merit Scheme. And I'll have a, a brief description of that um, a little further in, in this presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Maciej Cytowski. I'm um, currently the head of scientific services here at Posey Supercomputing Center. That means that I'm uh, responsible for supercomputing data and uh, visualization services and uh, have a, a great pleasure to work with researchers that are using uh, our services and collaborating with us on, on, on uh, numerous projects. Uh, next slide, please. Just to introduce uh, Posey Supercomputing Research Center is located in Perth, Western Australia. We are a T1 uh, supercomputing uh, facility. Uh, we have been posed, launched at Posey in 2014, but with foundations back to uh, around 2000. Um, and just recently we have been, uh, we have been supported by Australian government uh, to run a capital refresh project of all our uh, uh, computational and uh, data resources uh, through a, a 70 million grant that will have um, cap, uh, quite significant implications to the services that we do provide. And I will, I will go through that uh, today also during the uh, short, short presentation. POSI is a, uh, is a uh, unicorporated joint venture between four Western Australia universities and CSIRO, we are supported by Australian government and also uh, state government. Um, I want to say that uh, the most important resource that we do provide is actually uh, support uh, of our staff. We have uh, 50 plus staff employed at, um, at POSI uh, in terms of the supercomputing application scheme. Uh, uh, we have um, specialists with research backgrounds, most of them with, with PhDs in various fields, including bioinformatics, but also quantum chemistry, uh, computational fluid dynamics, astrophysics, computational science, and, and more. That means that the, the model that we actually imp are implementing at POSI is not only giving you access to the to computational resources that I will introduce, but, but also working with you to make sure that your workflows are well optimized and helping you to get to, to large scale of, of compute to, to start to use those, those um, larger supercomputing facilities at, at POSI or, uh, or at NCI. Uh, currently, we are supporting uh, more than 200 projects, large scale projects on the supercomputing system and 3,000, 3, uh, more than 3,000 researchers. But we also do have a couple of other services like Nimbus Cloud that I'll mention later uh, that, that adds uh, additional numbers to, 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 to both of those um, uh, categories. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you an example of projects that are currently allocated, large scale projects that are currently are allocated in our supercomputing infrastructure, we have decided to to, to, uh, to share two examples, and that's one uh, is related to human and the other one is related to plant genomics, one from Curtin University, the other one from Teleton uh, Kids Institute. Uh, we, we think that this is, this is actually a very interesting um, representation of the bioinformatics projects that are currently implemented at POSI because uh, we, we have also contributed to those projects in terms of helping those groups to get into, into that scale. And especially in this first example, uh, Posey was was contributing to help help the researchers uh, to develop their own their, their new workflows at scale uh, with the use of Nextflow a Nextflow tool. And as a result of that, uh, Audrey Stott and uh, Marco de la Pierre, who are Posey representatives, were uh, were actually um, uh, working also on a joint publication with with that group. So this is this is a, just an example of how how we work with, with researchers. Next slide, please. In terms of our uh, services, POSI's core service is providing supercomputing resources for large-scale science. Um, 
so in the current systems, Magnus, um, uh, which you can see here on the on the photo on the right hand side, Zeus and Topaz, Topaz being a GPU accelerated system. But in the context of our next system, Cetonics, we are here talking about the most uh, powerful in terms of performance and the most energy efficient in terms of, or green if you wish, uh, supercomputing facility in Australasia. That, that system will be installed in uh, next uh, next year. Um, and I'll, I'll mention, mention the specifics of that system in a uh, couple of my next slides. We do also provide complementary services, uh, which are cloud data and visualization services to support all the needs of uh, large-scale science. Uh, that means that if you have a project uh, running and are accessing uh, our supercomputing services through merit allocations, uh, and but you have some additional needs, for instance, to share your data uh, through some web interfaces. You can spin up some uh, virtual machines and and basically use other services for uh, to meet all the requirements of your of your science. However, the Nimbus Research Cloud should be also mentioned to uh, here as a um, as a tool that we are actually using, and many often uh, also with bioinformatic groups. Uh, to help researchers to scale up their workflows uh, to, to become, let's say, supercomputer ready. Uh, and that's possible because of the um, uh, also how we are configuring those systems and how similar those environments are. From the point of view of supercomputing services, access to those currently is through merit allocation calls. Uh, so uh, POSI will continue to support open science through to merit allocation calls uh, like NCMAS, uh, NCMAS actually POSI being uh, the biggest contributor uh, to, to NCMAS uh, in terms of the computational uh, resources in uh, next, next year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, just to introduce our new system that will be coming online uh, next year. Cetonics uh, is a um, scientific name for Quokka. So uh, this is uh, this is our um, local WA animal that we really like, and uh, the name of the system is um, is, uh, is and the system is named after after the Quokka. Uh, it will be a 50 petaflop system. As will will be based on more than 200,000 uh, AMD Milan CPU cores. And it will have a, um, a separate GPU, so accelerated uh, module, uh, which will be composed of more than 750 uh, GPUs. Uh, scratch file system, so the file system that you will use during running your computations on, on that system will be around 15 petabytes. But an interesting fact about uh, that system, it will be a hybrid one, which means uh, that it will have um, around three petabyte SSD uh, partition from uh, bioinformatics workflows perspective, that means that you, you might expect that it might give you an additional acceleration. We find that uh, bioinformatics work workflows are usually working with uh, huge, uh, huge amounts of files. This, this, this specific design of the scratch file system will help you to, to tackle those kind of, those kind of issues. Um, other thing that I wanted to mention, you, you might have noticed recent announcement about um, our storage services. Uh, POSI will extend our storage capabilities to around 130 petabytes uh, uh, based on a multi-tiered storage. And this will be available uh, uh, this calendar year. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, a lot of our researchers uh, are still thinking about POSI as a, um, uh, as a, as a center that is mainly supporting um, radio astronomy and uh, Australian SKA, also through POSI's name, but uh, if you are still not convinced of my talk, uh, how POSI can support bioinformatics, uh, let me try to convince you again that, uh, that POSI is actually bioinformatics as well. Uh, so here is just a selection of, of uh, activities that we do. Uh, together with biocommons uh, or uh, just, just running them um, uh, in our center, we, ha we have dedicated support for bioinformatics, um, investing along in making sure that we can support bioinformatics and provide necessary tools, um, leveraging all POSI services. You know, it, it might be across cloud and supercompute, it might be across data storage, cloud and supercompute with various tools that, that I have mentioned here. Uh, and yeah, 
supporting also bioinformatics community to biocommons um, uh, project. Um, we are running multiple events uh, uh, related to, to bioinformatics. Uh, we have run bioinformatics symposium in the past, uh, uh, bioinformatics scale and um, Australia Next Generation of super, Supercomputers event with uh, amazing uh, part participations. We are actually um, measured in uh, around 100 people uh, attending both of those. Uh, we are running trainings related to bioinformatics, related to containers, use of containers in bioinformatics, and implementing some scalable uh, bioinformatics flow work. So organizing some specific uh, sessions. Our last thing that I wanted to mention here is that we are also uh, supporting bioinformatics community through a community of practice that we have built together with uh, BioCommons the Slack channel and, and so on. Uh, next slide, please. That's actually the end of my, my part. Just wanted to mention that there are a couple of uh, links and uh, places where you can find us and follow, uh, uh, find some more information, then, but also please uh, feel free to contact me if you have any further questions. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Rosemary Sadsad. I'm the informatics manager at the Sydney Informatics Hub, University of Sydney. And I'm going to give a very brief overview of uh, commercial services, uh, which are another option um, to that that has been presented today. Next, please. Uh, so first up, we have Doug. They are a commercial HPC and cloud provider based out of Western Australia. Uh, they pride themselves on being uh, a, great, a green uh, data center and reducing that carbon footprint. Um, we've engaged with them previously and what uh, with values, um, their support when we were um, being onboarded to their system. Essentially, we gave them uh, a list of our software, some test data, and they installed it, optimized it, uh, tested it, and then called us back in so that we could just hit the ground running and do our research. Uh, they've worked with uh, several uh, medical life science research uh, groups, including the Harry Perkins Institute of Medical Research in CSIRO. Next, please. And also through that, they've um, got some available pipelines there, including transcript and denote assembly, uh, variant calling uh, pipelines, a DNA zoo um, suite, and, um, and uh, I guess something that's a bit different uh, at Doug is they ask, their file system is different to some of the national uh, facilities that we have uh, previously described using this vast file system, which um, is quite suitable to some of the bioinformatics workflows, including a transcript and de novo assembly of a um, marsupial sample. And you can see the reduction in time to compute that there. Next, please. Uh, so for more information about Doug, go to their website or contact Aaron. Okay, next. Uh, you're probably more familiar with uh, Microsoft Azure. Um, they are, are, offer a range of uh, virtual machines, different size virtual machines, HPC in the cloud, um, remote desktops that are also, or can be GPU powered as well. Next, please. They also provide genomics as a service. So they have a BWA mapping, uh, GTK variant calling uh, pipeline that has been finely tuned to their system. Uh, it will enable um, you to have a sample with uh, say 30 times coverage to be to go from raw reads to your um, genetic variant calling file in under four hours. Next, please. They also have a range of training resources available to help you get started um, with their systems and doing analyses there. Please go to their website or contact them via email to learn more. Next, please. And uh, finally, we've got AWS. Um, they have a very wide range of different types of um, compute services, uh, virtual machine shapes and sizes that um, you can pick and choose to suit your very varied um, omics workloads. Next, please. Um, what's been really neat is seeing AWS partner with Ronan. Uh, Ronan provide a really nice dashboard so you can actually um, visualize and see the resources uh, that you've selected and used, um, monitor their usage and the costs that you're accruing also. Next, please. Uh, AWS have links into some public data sets, including the 1000 uh, Genomes Project TCGA data sets. They also have uh, some commercial uh, pipelines available like the Illumina Dragon and NVIDIA Parabricks, 
which is a GPU powered variant calling pipeline. Next, please. Uh, they work with researchers in many different ways. They help, um, you know, write the computing aspects for grant proposals. They provide workshops um, and events. Next, please. And for more information, please visit uh, their website and their training links. And thank you. Right. Hello again, um, Roger Edberg, NCI. Um, I will give uh, in this section just a very brief overview of NCMAS. Um, NCMAS is stands for the National Computational Merit Allocation Scheme, which has been in operation for more than ten years as a uh, as a uh, merit based um, program to allocate resources on on um, facilities within Australia. So. For the um, 2022 call, which has just been um, just been opened um, today, um, the there are three facilities offering resources. Um, so NCI um, will offer 280 uh, million service units uh, for calendar year 2022 on Gadi. Pa uh, Pausey will offer, uh, with, with Satonix um, spinning up next year, they'll offer um, 200 and, uh, actually, I think the number is slightly larger than this, um, uh, than 250 um, or thereabouts, um, million service units. Um, the Pausey offering is interesting in that it will it'll be rolled out in two, um, two parts. Um, uh, because the and this is because the um, the Satonic system will be basically under construction through part of of, of the um, calendar year 2022. Um, so uh, that's that's a very interesting development in terms of NC Mass, where things have been very um, very sort of traditional, if you like. Um, also on, on on offer is uh, a time at Massive on M3, um, two and a half um, million service units. The the offering at Massive is is um, looks small, but um, M3 is a is a very is a system with very specialized um, uses uh, and with a with a um, GPU focus and 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 built basically for data interactive data visualization. Um, so the key thing to remember with with uh, NC Mass is that allocations are made um, through a merit-based competitive process. Um, there's a committee um, uh, of of 34, uh, 34 um, computational science researchers, peer review, um, and uh, all applications go through this process. Um, at the in, in recent years, um, the success rate for NC Mass, uh, that is the, the, the number of the percentage of applications that receive an allocation is roughly uh, three of every four or about 75%. Um, uh, but it's also worth mentioning that many, uh, many applications receive an allocation, but they receive less than they request. And this is because demand for NC mass resources is, is always exceeds supply. And, and the typical uh, uh, demand is, is on the order of three times, uh, three times more than, than what's available. Um, next slide, please. So um, the, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of practical information, the, the call for the 2022 call is open now. We, it was scheduled to open yesterday. We just had to do a few final housekeeping things um, this morning before opening it up. Um, the the link on the on the um, on the screen is your main go to um, go to point for that. So there's that has the online form, the um, uh, supporting information, including um, advice on on um, an, writing your proposal in the in the um, uh, an, an anonymized format that's now required. Um, also FAQs um, and, and other supporting info. I'd strongly recommend anyone who's interested to have a look there and as a first step, have a read through the um, the information for applicants document. That's that's the key reference in terms of what NCMAS is, how it operates and how to go about um, framing an application. 
Thank you. Uh, so as you can see, we've got a lot of resources um, available for you guys to use. It's just a matter of working out what your needs are um, and how you can get access to the facilities that best meet those needs. Um, a big part of the work we've been doing with the BioCommons is developing a lot of resources to support you in working with these different infrastructures. So as we've mentioned, there's lots of training materials available um, and a lot of pipelines and tools available um, specifically for these infrastructures. They're freely available for you to use. Um, we're going to circulate some information on where you can find all these things um, after the webinar. Um, thank you for joining us today. I'm just going to hand back to Melissa. Thanks very much to all of our speakers. We do now have time for questions if you have something to ask. Okay, so one quick question that I have for our panelists is um, in relation to sensitive data, which of the resources that we spoke about today are suitable for that? And do you have any recommendations? Um, I'll, I'll just say that the ARDC is funding a a research platform on sensitive data, the, the secure e-research platform. Uh, it's being um, uh, run by Monash University, who already has this set up at, uh, its, on its own facility on, on the Nectar Cloud, but it's uh, extending it to multiple organisations running on multiple um, infrastructure. Um, so that project is in train, so uh, there will be uh, an option for doing that. There's uh, another... Um, Another similar application called Erica, which again ARDC is funding that runs on the Amazon cloud. Uh, so I think some of those projects are all available at the moment and some are sort of still working uh, on developing it, but that's something you can follow up on. In general, the Nectar cloud can be used for some types of sensitive data. It depends how sensitive and exactly what kind of data and what you want to do. Okay, thank you. So I think in most cases, including for sensitive data, the best way forward is to, to get in touch with the particular resource that you're thinking of using and work through the different options that they have, because I know most do have different um, ways that they can help you out. Uh, so one more question before we wrap up is, is there a separate merit allocation scheme for palsy or is it through the NCMAPS? Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll address this one. So, uh, yeah, so we have, we are currently running two merit allocation uh, calls. One is uh, NCMAS uh, in collaboration with uh, NCI and other uh, facilities in Australia. Uh, and the other one is uh, POSI Partner Scheme, which is available for, uh, for Western Australia universities, uh, CSIRO, as well as WA government um, organizations. And both schemes have very similar application process uh, and assessment uh, process as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. We are at time, so we are going to have to leave it there for today. Let me see if my screen share works this time around. Okay, so thank you very much to all of our speakers today. It's been a very enlightening webinar. And thank you to the audience for joining us as well. Finally, the Australian Boy Commons is enabled by NCRIS via Bi Platforms Australia funding. Thank you for joining us and we hope to see you again soon. Bye for now. <laughs>